welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, I am the Diamond Alexis. And for today's video, I'm going to be answering all of the frequently asked questions that I get about my job working in LO. Now, if one of your questions for me is what exactly is LO, I want you to stop what you're doing, pause this video, and go watch the video that I have linked in my description box about LOASM, which is the entire breakdown of what my job actually is. We'll have to go ahead and watch that video for context in order for this video to make sense. Now, don't get me wrong. Even though I took that really long hiatus off of YouTube for like a year, I was still reading you guys' comments. I was still checking my DMs. And these were all of the questions that I was finding uh, were getting asked the most. If you're interested in having LO as a job and you have tons of questions, just keep on watching and hopefully I'm able to answer them. Well, aside from the question of what is LO, like I said, go ahead and check out my other video um, that talks all about the career field itself. I get what do we actually do on a daily basis, pretty much. In my original LO video, like I said, I gave an introduction about what LO actually is as a career field, but I didn't really go into depth about what kind of uh, work we actually do. So LO is actually made up of a bunch of different shops. So the first shop that we have is production. Production will pretty much be split up between uh, production and flightline crew. Production is pretty much where you'll get all of your on the job training. So this is all of the work that we do on the jet, touch-ups, canopies, wingtips, anything like that. Any kind of uh, exterior repairs pretty much is what production is gonna be. Flight line is more of the kind of structural repairs that come up, so stuck fasteners. It can also possibly be sent on the line to uh, do cure checks evaluations. We do have a couple of different inspection crews. The name of each one will vary depending on what jet you're working on, but basically you could be put on the inspection crew that will do a whole inspection of the entire jet for any damages, anything that would cause the um, jet to be grounded and not be able to fly. They're responsible for finding those things out and documenting them so that they reflect uh, accurately in the system. Or you could also be on another inspection team, which is called audits, which you're basically identifying every single damage on the entire jet, notating it, putting it in the system so that those damages can be fixed, taken care of, anything like that. You will also have the corrosion shop, which is all of the painting, sanding, blasting. A lot of the things that you will do in tech school will happen in the corrosion shop. I was in Corrosion uh, about a year ago for about six months and I absolutely love my time over there. Along with Corrosion, you will have tailpipes, um, which if your aircraft that you're particularly working on has tailpipes, then you will be in that shop doing different repairs to the tailpipes. Of course, we also have support, AKA tool crib. These guys are responsible for distributing all the tools and materials that you might need on the job. And they also have one of the newest programs coming about called Core 54. Now, they're kind of trying to instill this whole um, multi-capable airman concept, which basically means not only can you do your job, but you can do another career fields job. So I went through Core 54 um, about a year and a half ago when I first got up here and pretty much they just had me leave the LO shop and go work with the crew chief AMU doing a lot of crew chief tasks. So launch and recovering jets, um, refueling, things like that, doing like crew chief type inspections. I had a lot of fun over there. Um, it's not something that's mandatory that you have to do. Sometimes your leadership may ask you if you want to do the Core 54 program, or in my case, they can just sign you up and just tell you you're going. But once you uh, start to make rank and become an NCO, different instructor uh, opportunities will come about. So you can apply to be a tech school instructor, or you can uh, decide to do an FTD instructor, which FTD is basically intro classes that you have to take uh, for LO and they'll teach you the different fundamentals of various jobs that you'll be doing while you're working on the jet. So the next question I get quite a bit is how long is the tech school? So LO tech school is based out of Pensacola, Florida and it is 60 days long. If you're any more curious about tech school, I also have a video that I posted about 10 reasons why tech school is lit. I enjoyed my time there. And if you just so happen to get LO as a job, I hope your experience is just as fun as mine was. Also recently I've heard that LO tech schools are joining with ASM tech schools. When I went through, um, LO and ASM were completely separate and they went through two different tech schools. So as we speak, 
LO and ASM tech schools are joined together. If you guys didn't know, they pretty much differ um, very slightly, as, at least in tech school. Um, we did a lot of like sheet metal work, which ASM pretty much is. And for the longest time, we never understood why LO and ASM were split up to begin with, because we pretty much do the same things. Like we work on a lot of the same things. So one question that I've gotten a lot that I was never able, well, I don't know if I was never able to, but I never thought I was able to answer was, what basis can we go to with having LO as, as a career? And I never thought I was able to answer that, but all this information is online. I got this information online, so I will post it here, pause to read. So yeah, as of right now, those are the bases that we can go to. Like I was saying uh, with the LO and ASM merge, because ASM could go to like a plethora of bases just being ASM. Um, so now with the merge, I don't know how the merge is going to work as far as like if LO is going to be able to go to ASM bases and like it's going to be a whole cross training type thing. I don't know. I have no idea as of right now. All I know is that that the integration is happening. So the next question is what are the hours like? So typically you will work a regular eight hour shift. LO is typically a 24 hour shop. So you will have a day shift, a swing shift and a mid shift. I don't really mind working either shift. Um, it really just depends on who I'm working with, which will determine on whether or not I love it or hate it. But swings is my all time favorite. I can maybe count on both hands how many times I've worked at 12. And I'm not gonna say that those come up rarely. So the, it varies, but from the two bases that I've been to, 12 hour shifts do not happen that often. Next question I get a lot, especially for people who are talking to recruiters and are interested in LO as a career field is, do we deploy? Yes and no. And that is all I'm allowed to say about that. <laughs> Next question is, is the work difficult? Now, with every question I get about this, which usually comes from people who have never really had a mechanical job or like a maintenance job or whatever, never really worked with their hands. So they're worried about whether or not they'll be able to do the job and perform, you know, well. And I tell everybody this, I tell everyone, if I can do this job, anybody can do this job, okay? I had never worked at a job that I had to use my hands, I had to use mechanical skills or whatever. And I'm still learning my job to this day. Like I've been up in Alaska for about a year and a half and I'm just now getting back on the jet. So like I feel like a brand new three level straight out of tech school, like just now learning this job all over again. Because let me, let's talk about it. Let, let me tell you guys, let me tell you guys. So I got up here and process and everything. I maybe did like one or two jobs on the jet, one or two before they were like, hey, you're going to Core 54 for like two, three months. So I was like, okay, cool, say less. Wasn't on the jet. So I was gone from the shop for like those three months. Right after that, they're like, hey, you're gonna go to Corrosion next for six months. Then after that, I still wasn't on the jet. I then went to two different inspection crew like teams and that lasted for about nine months collectively. And then after that, for like another three weeks to like a month, I went TDY. And then after that, I found out I made staff and they sent me to ALS, which was five weeks long. So now, finally, I'm coming up like on my two year mark in a couple months, and I'm just now figuring out working on the jet. So your girl has been struggling, okay? To say the very least. My shop basically sent me everywhere else but on the jet until now. So I am I'm thoroughly like out on the jobs, trying to learn this thing through and through. So it's taking time. I know I need a lot more practice to even get remotely good at uh, doing repairs and stuff um, at this point. But like I said, if I can do it and if I can learn it, I feel like anybody can do this job. This is actually a really good question that I got that I don't get asked a whole lot, but it's of what are some of your daily stresses at work? And I really had to think about this because I actually like my job. Um, but honestly, some of the daily stressors could be like, maybe you're working on a shift that you don't really care for the people who you work with. Cause don't get me wrong, every job has dirt bags. Like everybody has jobs working with people that they don't like. So that could be a stressor for some people. Um, if let's say maintenance is crazy and you end up finding out last minute that you have to work at 12 maybe, 
that can be stressful. If you mess up on a job and it causes rework, let's say that, I, that to me stresses me out more than anything. If I like screw up a job or if I don't put out a job to like my liking or whatever, like I'm stressing. I'm definitely stressing, especially if it causes me to have to redo that job over again. Um, I don't know, I should have like hit up some of my coworkers to uh, ask them what their daily stresses were to give you guys a better answer. But as for me, those are pretty much the only things that I can like really think of right now. Another common question that I get is, is it hard to promote in LO? I'd say it is easy to promote. Just understand what your career field is looking for as far as like chances to advance. So like, if you know, like for us, we know that education is a good bullet. We know that volunteer work is a good bullet when trying to make staff. We know that, you know, being involved in programs and like doing things for the shop and being good at your job and knowledgeable about your job, like those are all things that go into it. So by knowing what it is, so, so knowing what it takes to get promoted and to look, you know, good on your EPR, I'd say, I, I'd say it's easy. Once you figure that out, I think it's easy to just do those things. Just do what you're supposed to do. But I will say, and I will go into depth about this in my EPR video, just because you are a good maintainer, okay, hear me, hear me out. Just because you are good at your job, speaking like you put out good work, good maintenance, you know, you, you do good repairs, whatever you want to call it. Just because you are good, you are stellar, you are the best at that, that does not necessarily mean that you will get promoted. And I think a lot of people feel like they want to be the best and that they put out the best work and they're the hardest workers. Like they'll go out and do any job and they get it done quickly and it looks nice, whatever. That does not necessarily mean that you are going to get promoted. There's a lot of other things and a lot of other factors that go into getting promoted. Oh, I can't wait to make that EPR video. Honestly, I will go into all of that in that video, I promise. And the last common question that I get quite a bit is how is the quality of life for someone working in LO? And honestly, there's so many factors that go into that as well because LO is really what you make of it. A lot of the times we have people who didn't want LO and who just got put in here or they didn't know what LO was so they they got stuck in it and or they they get stationed at a base that they didn't want or a base that they don't like or you know whatever the case may be and I feel like if you constantly are looking at the negative of your situation you're not gonna like it like unless you have an open mind you are not going to like LO you are not going to like the bases that you have to go to and like you're not gonna like it if you're closed-minded and you're fixated on a particular base or how you think it's gonna be or you know this whole fantasy that you have in your head if you are fixated on that like it, it's gonna be what you make of it if you have a negative attitude towards your job or to your base or your dorms or whatever the case is you're it's just gonna be negative you're gonna have a negative experience whereas Honestly, I don't like the cold. I got stationed in Alaska and what do you think I had to do? I had to make the best of it. Yes, there are certain things that I dislike about this place and some days are hard in the shop, but what what job doesn't have hard days? What job doesn't have, you know, it's, it's downsides. You just can't dwell on it. You can't dwell on the negative. And then honestly, like if you think about it, if you don't, if you, if it turns out that you don't like it, you only signed a contract for four to six years. Just do your time, make the best of it, find out what makes you happy, what makes you, you know, want to get up in the morning and whatever. And just use that as your motivation to get through it. Because afterwards, you can either choose to re-enlist or you can choose to get out. But at least while you're in, make the most of it. Some other factors that may go into it, it may depend on your shop. Again, I've only been to two bases, so I can only speak from the standpoint of someone who's only been to two LO bases. Um, and it really depends on like your leadership and your the people that you work around. Do they take care of you? You know, do you have a good supervisor? Do you have a good sponsor when you get to the base? Like, how is the area itself? You know, those kinds of things really depend. And, and it, think it varies on the person as well and the person's preferences. My biggest piece of advice for people 
joining the military is to have an open mind because if you're just expecting the rest of the world and the rest of your career to be like where you're from or where you grew up, you're not gonna like it. Also, don't make your first base be the end all be all of what you think the rest of the Air Force is. Because I I see that a lot and I even made that, um, that mistake of when I got stationed at my first base, I was like, this sucks, I'm probably not gonna I'm probably not gonna re-enlist. Like, if I don't get orders within my time here, like, I'm probably gonna get out of the military, this sucks. But then I got orders and I came to this base and I understood that not everywhere is going to be like my first base. So if you're thinking, if you're at your first base and you don't like it, please, please, please do not expect the rest of the Air Force or the rest of the other bases to be like that. But that is it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to check out those videos that I linked in the description box. The one about my tech school, the original video that I made introducing LO to YouTube, I guess. If you enjoy this type of content, definitely go ahead and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on social media, which is also linked down below. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.